next time we'll be going just a bit more modern, and I hope you'll indulge me here. I think you ruptured my little piggy's spleen! It feels surreal to me that I'm able to play this game at all. While much of the staff has changed in that time span, Appeal Studios have been trying to get a sequel to Outcast made for well over 20 years. Even after closing down in the 2000s, founders Yves Grolet, Frank Sauer, and Jan Robert I hope I didn't mangle the pronunciation too bad pulled the band back together for an updated re-release of Outcast and later a remake. Though I wasn't all that impressed by said remake, I held out hope that any potential follow-up would be much better. Lo and behold, Outcast, a new beginning. Obviously, what with it being a sequel and all, it'd be next to impossible to discuss a new beginning without spoiling some parts of the first game. I'll try to limit it where I can, but there will likely be major spoilers involved. Set an, initially, indeterminate period after the first game, rather than being sent home as he expected, Cutter Slade Bridge, large meats. Hunt, speed chunk. Butch, deadlift. finds himself teleported back to the planet Adelpha for unknown reasons. Making matters more confusing is that his memories are scrambled and he can hardly even remember what happened the last time he was here, conveniently providing an excuse to explain things to new players. After stumbling his way out of the temple, Cutter forms an uneasy alliance with the Dolatai guardian Lee has. The Ulukai should know about Talans. So who are you? The name's Slade. Commander Cutter Slade. Back, finger monster, or by the yods, I'll make a trophy out of your deformed hands. Okay, no handshakes. To fight back against the alien invaders threatening Adelpha in exchange for finding Slade a way home to his daughter, Camilla. A daughter whom I don't recall being mentioned at all in the first game. Now granted, Outcast 1 didn't have the best story. I was far more fascinated by the world building and learning about the Talon and their culture than the relationship drama between him and his ex, Marion. However, I feel like I'd remember them both talking about a daughter at some point during the adventure. But I could be wrong though. I do have the memory of a concussed goldfish, so I'm not gonna hold this against the rest of the game. Things are complicated further for Slade when he discovers that these robotic invaders looking to plunder Adelpha for its resources are in fact being led by other humans. Hey, wait a minute. This is your home planet? We're the evil invading aliens? Correct. Whether intentional or not, I have no clue what plot points were reused from the original plans for Outcast 2 back in 2002. The comparisons to Avatar are hard to ignore. That lemur! He's earthbending! You idiot, it's the girl! Oh, of course. No, not the one I always think of, the James Cameron one. Seeing as how the first game was very obviously inspired by Stargate... It's the Foggate! It's not a huge surprise to see that A New Beginning took some cues from a more recent sci-fi film. Do I wish it was one I had anything resembling an opinion on? Sure, but I'll take what I can get. One of my big fears with this was that they were just going to follow the same beats as the original with nothing to really set it apart. My other fear was that the excellent world building and the organic feel to exploration of the first game would take a back seat to focus on the more dynamic combat which was being shown off in all of the trailers. And to a point, it sort of did. The need to hunt down specific Talon upon arriving at a new location has been replaced by the usual quest markers you see in every open world these days. Yet the ability to talk every major character to death about all sorts of world building topics is still present, and this team is clearly just as proud of their work on that front as the originals. One needs a certain downbringing to lead. Downbringing? You mean upbringing, right? I mean class and dignity. Only citizens of the ground have good social standing. The treetops are for uneducated people, rude people. One cannot learn class, especially someone like Moore. In fact, they even included the hard work of die-hard German-speaking outcast fans who attempted to craft a whole functional version of the Talon language, called Agazork, from the small snippets of Agazork used in the first game. Fabian Benkovic, again really sorry if I'm bungling the pronunciation, who was both part of that fan group and worked on a new beginning as lore designer, 
has an interesting video on his channel explaining the process behind adapting that work into what was used in A New Beginning that I'll link in the description. That man is living every fan's dream and I for one am jealous as hell. In addition to the world of Adelpha being as fascinating as it was the first time around, I feel that this time Appeal did a much better job when it comes to characterization, especially when it comes to the Talon you'll be helping across Slade's journey. Even if Outcast had its own share of standout characters as well, there were also plenty of quest givers not given enough time to really display any memorable traits or quirks. That's really just a consequence of being such an early 3D sandbox. In a new beginning, by contrast, virtually every named NPC I spoke to felt like full-fledged characters. You know how some games have the kind of character writing where you get a sense that the writers came up with elaborate backstories and profiles for each NPC, even if half of that wound up not being used in the finished product? That's the vibe I got, even from dickhead Talon who can go revert themselves for all I care like Hotso. I wish I could stay longer, but you have to go? Good. Yeah, fuck you too! The human characters, being mostly in visions Slate occasionally gets while teleporting, unfortunately feel much more cookie cutter. The big bad, General Jack Borum, gets hit with the worst of this. Despite the interesting wrinkle of having been Marion's fiancé prior to her death in the first game, leading him to believe that Slade left her to die, and a solid villainous performance from Eric Meyer, just watch that be the only name I actually managed to bungle. Jack never really moves beyond feeling like the generic, crazed general archetype. I can no longer sit back and allow communist infiltration, communist indoctrination, communist subversion, and the international communist conspiracy to sap and impurify all of our precious bodily fluids. It's not as if he doesn't function fine as the primary antagonist, but I get a sense that the story wants me to feel more sympathy for him than I can muster. Before I move on to the gameplay, I want to be sure to note that Cutter Slade himself is a surprising exception to the weak characterization of the other humans. In Outcast 1, Slade was characterized as a snarky, 90s action hero akin to Bruce Willis in his prime, to the coast. We'll get together, have a few laughs. who was also voiced by Rayman. Rayman! However, in an interesting bit of synergy with my issues regarding Jack Borum's characterization in A New Beginning, Slade felt rather flat outside of his quips, and I feel it hampered the potential of several dramatic scenes. Apparently, someone on the writing team for A New Beginning was of a similar mind, as Slade displays a much wider range of emotion throughout the game, and despite my initial misgivings about replacing David Gassman as Slade's voice actor, Luke Roberts does an absolutely excellent job in the role. Okay, let me get this straight. You want me to risk my life fighting a flock of killer birds to get you the plants you'll turn into a bunch of blankets? This at least gets me a discount, right? Moving on to the gameplay, a new beginning is structured much like its predecessor. There are several villages dotted across the map which need Slade's help. In order to progress and get what he needs from each village, he'll have to win over the locals by helping them with their problems, as well as defend them from both the threats posed by the invaders and threats indirectly caused by the invasion. The most immediate difference is that this time the entire map is available to the player as one big open world, rather than being a series of smaller areas connected by these teleportals known as Daoka. When I played the demo prior to release, I was concerned that the number of these challenge icons I saw on the map meant that I was going to be in for a Ubisoft open world where the map is so overcrowded that finding the interesting content is like a needle in a haystack. Thankfully, my concerns were proven wrong. While I do think that many of these parkour and combat challenges are a weak substitute for genuine side quests, the distinctiveness of each region and the meatiness of the main quest do plenty to alleviate the issue for me. Not to mention that Appeal had the basic decency to not put every fucking collectible on the map. For instance, you have to actually track down these hidden weapon module parts yourself, with your only indicators that one is nearby being a faint sound cue and this glow once you get close enough. Incentivizing players to explore around the open world you crafted and enjoy the traversal mechanics you work so hard on? What a strange concept. Seriously, I cannot stress enough how amazing traversal feels in a new beginning. Anyone else remember how fun it was to just travel around the map in Just Cause 2 and, to a lesser extent, Just Cause 3? Well, guess what a new beginning feels exactly like in this department? Slade even gets access to his own wingsuit. All you need to do is track down enough blue helidium to upgrade the starting jetpack, and before you know it, you've got a rocket-boosted wingsuit and are able to hover in mid-air while raining down red-hot death from above just like a Mandalorian. Boba, the whole thing? 
thing was just a dream? Yes, with an if, no with a but. We are in the pit. But I took Solo and the whiny blonde kid out, right? Uh, no, you didn't. Well, <laughs> Sarlacc ate some more sand people, though. You feel like Tuscan food tonight? <sighs> I guess. Traversal on the ground feels similarly fantastic as, from the start, you're able to fly low to the ground for quicker travels from place to place before you fully upgrade to the wingsuit and boost jets. I think the best judge of a game's traversal is how often I feel the need to fast travel. To that point, in spite of the numerous daokas spread across the map, the only reason I started using fast travel at all was because I was running out of time to finish a new beginning in time for this video. That is how much I enjoyed traveling around Adelpha and taking in the sights of this beautifully alien world. Well, that and blasting Danger Zone as I frolicked in the air like a gentle woodland pixie. And if blasting Danger Zone isn't the greatest litmus test for how awesome flying about in a game feels, then I don't know what is. This is the best gliding mechanic I've experienced in a game since Arkham City. Combat, meanwhile, isn't on the same level of quality as Traversal, but it's still leagues better than the Combat in Second Contact, the remake of the first game. There, you pretty much just step side to side as enemies strode in a single file line towards you. Which was especially odd when the enemy AI in the original version was quite clever and would often move to flank the player while they were distracted by another enemy. A New Beginning is much closer to that in feel. They were never quite as much of a challenge as the early game in Outcast but I certainly couldn't bowl over every encounter as if they were nothing like I could in Second Contact. Really, the worst I can say about the enemies is the limited variety you'll face across your playthrough. Barring boss fights that I don't wish to spoil, you'll spend 99% of this game fighting the same sets of enemies and their more dangerous, upgraded forms. I have a higher tolerance for repetition than others thanks to all the grinding I've done in RPGs for most of my life, but even I have to admit that by the end, I was really hoping for a different kind of basic enemy to appear and throw me for a loop. The added movement mechanics provide a number of opportunities to get around cover for a clean shot or a quick escape in an emergency. It also means that the game expects your reflexes to keep up. Whether it's dodging incoming fire with a quick boost, or utilizing Slade's new energy shield, you'd best get good at at least one of the two, because plenty of these robots pack a mean punch. The shield also functions as your melee attack, which can eventually be upgraded to charge up into what is essentially a buzzsaw made of hard light. And if you're feeling confident in your timing, you can also earn an upgrade which functions similar to a parry. Opening your shield right before getting shot will turn the shield gold and enable a powerful ranged attack that's probably amazing for those who can master the technique. What? You think I'm one of those people? I spent the better part of assaulting one base trying and failing to time it correctly so that I had usable footage for this part. Slade's weaponry has seen a massive overhaul as well. Gone is the wide arsenal you steadily built up across the game, replaced by the dreaded two-weapon swap system. <sighs> Halo Syndrome takes another victim. You hate to see it. I love messing things up. Or you would if the two guns Slade has access to weren't so customizable. Using the various modules you'll earn through quests or find lying about in the world, you can turn these firearms into virtually any kind of weapon you'd want. Personally, I've always been partial to a sniper rifle and a fallback rapid fire. Oh, would you look at that! But what if you want to go over the top and tank the game's frame rate by turning your pistol into an automatic shotgun that fires explosive rounds? Totally doable if you don't mind the eye strain. Even if I wound up settling into old habits with my weapon choices, it's cool to have such a freeform system that I can access at any time. There was no real punishment for experimentation. If a module didn't work like I wanted, then I could quickly open the menu mid-combat and switch it back to what I had before. No need to rush back to an arbitrary base camp or search for an upgrade station. Cutter Slade's a SEAL, damn it! He can field strip anything while under enemy fire. And that's how his daughter was born. You suck! Yeesh. Tough crowd. Overall, considering the amount of combat in A New Beginning, I'm grateful that Appeal included so many options for the player to mess around with. It doesn't manage to completely erase the sense of repetition with enemies by the end, but it certainly cushions the worst of it. What really kept me hooked, though, was the same thing that kept me hooked on the first game, Adelpha itself. Even if the graphics aren't exactly cutting edge, in fairness, I also had to lower the graphics a bit because my computer couldn't totally handle running a modern game and OBS at the same time, the work put into the presentation and aesthetics of every corner of the map 
demonstrates that raw graphical fidelity is never a substitute for artists who know what they're doing. Though even I have to admit that the amount of pop in at points is a little ridiculous for a... Well, it's clearly not AAA budget, but it's also not indie. AA? I'm going with AA. Is a little ridiculous for a AA game in 2024. And actually, I experienced quite a few bugs and glitches in general in my 25 hours with A New Beginning. Most of them were fairly inoffensive and just made me chuckle, like how every now and then an enemy would get caught in the level geometry, or the handful of times that a character's mouth wouldn't move while they spoke until the camera changed. But there were a couple really bad ones that did affect my experience. One was how this delivery shipment I was supposed to intercept never spawned in correctly once I got close enough and was stuck in far away scenery mode. Saving and reloading did nothing to fix this, and since it was an optional objective, at the time I just shrugged and carried on. But I wouldn't be doing my sort of job if I didn't acknowledge faults like this. There was also the much more egregious issue that popped up a few times later in the game. Very minor spoiler warning first. I'm not going to show any massive story spoilers or the like, but seeing as how this is a dialogue issue, I can't exactly showcase it without spoiling some of the bug dialogue. So, for reasons unknown, there are moments where the actual voice actor's dialogue is straight up missing and is replaced by what is clearly a placeholder performance. The first time this happened to me was when Marzo here suddenly developed either an Australian or New Zealand accent for a few lines before returning to his normal voice. I'll send whatever they need. Who should I talk to over there? That would be Draud. <laughs> oh, I know Draud. He's still selling blue hair. Maybe I'll ask him for a couple of crystals for the next orchestra. Another son to help me run this brewery would be nice. Maybe a trade-off is possible. Well, I'm sure you two can work out an arrangement. So, can I count on you? I'm your Talon. Tell Draud it's coming. I'll have Mirko prepare a shipment soon. Considering this happened to me at about 2 a.m., I initially thought I was imagining the voice change. Then I realized what was going on when it went back to normal that... Nope. They left in a placeholder voiceover. Thankfully, this never occurred during an important story bit to spoil the experience entirely, and with any luck, it will have been patched by the time this video goes up. But the fact remains that this was present at launch. Modern game development is extremely complex, I understand that fact. Bugs are all but guaranteed with how massive video games are expected to be now, and virtually no developer is given the time they need to fix every single issue, much less prepare the game for every possible PC configuration. That said, even with how rarely this occurred compared to the rest of the voice lines playing as intended, I really can't let this one slide. Not when immersing the player into the alien world you created is your dialogue-heavy game's big hook. All of the love and care put into A New Beginning by the staff deserves better than that. Moving back towards the positives, Lenny Moore is back in the composer's chair to do his Lenny Moore thing. That is to say, he composed yet another banger of a soundtrack that is John Williams as fuck. Music isn't exactly my expertise. I can rattle off a million different metal and punk bands that I like. But if you ask me to provide a description beyond the genre, I'll stumble over my words worse than I do while recording lines. Moving back to... Moving back towards the positives. So I'll leave it at this. I love Star Wars. I love John Williams. Lenny Moore is one of a handful of composers capable of replicating the way John Williams' music makes me feel. That's high praise! In my video discussing Outcast 1.1 and Second Contact, I compared the story to a summer blockbuster, in that I found it to be a well-executed, if unsurprising, tale where you'll most likely see the twists coming well in advance. A description that I feel for the most part fits a new beginning quite well, too. Trust me. If you don't have the slightest inkling who this woman Slade keeps seeing in his visions is by the halfway point, well, you'd have to be skipping every cutscene. That doesn't mean I think it's bad. I enjoyed the story for what it is. Really? How?
How did you spawn right behind me? But it didn't exactly inspire me to delve deeper into the underlying themes like I did with, say, Alundra. Between that and not wanting to spoil too much of the game as it's still extremely new, I decided instead to focus on a few highlights. Minor spoiler warning again. Like I said, I want to spoil as little as I can while properly covering all I wish to cover with a new beginning. But that still entails spoiling something. So if you don't want anything spoiled for you, skip ahead to hear for my conclusion. First off, I love the fact that we finally get to see what the Talon females and their children look like. For what I assume were initially budget reasons, none were present in the original and their absence was hand-waved away with the explanation that they were sequestered away on the inaccessible island of Kizar. With Kizar playing a major role in the plot this time around, we're shown a whole new side to Talon civilization. The biggest aspect absolutely being the introduction of the spiritual leader of the Talon people, the Almayel. I'm a sucker for the two who are as one concept, so I may or may not have had a brief moment of girlish squeeing when I got to this part. Sorry, sorry, just uh, <clears throat> got excited there. Then things get complicated when Slade delivers a message imparted to him by the Yods, Adelphus Four Deities, that leads to the Almayel coming to two opposite conclusions on how to prevent Talon extinction. One thinks that they must protect Kizar and continue to power the shield keeping out the invaders and any other unwanted foe, while the other believes that they must once again hold the long dormant festival of Okastok to shore up the Talon population. Take it away, Mr. Dangerfield! Hey everybody! We're all gonna get late! <laughs> the portrayal of both halves of the Almayel after they're thrown out of sync is quite interesting too. It's also amusing that not only does Slade switch to calling one Alma and the other Yell, but so does the interface. Then we have a cool bit of gameplay and story integration, where many of the objectives you need to complete for each village have a bare minimum needed for progress, but can be maxed out if you're feeling saucy. In several cases, this will offer a boost beyond simply offering a larger reward of resources to the player. Once you've made it far enough to earn your first beacon blueprint, Slade will gain access to a third weapon which can fire one of four unlockable beacons to summon aid. My personal favorite being these alien bees of death capable of tearing through even the toughest foes. And if you max out every objective related to them, they become even deadlier! I wouldn't call it a novel concept to offer these kinds of boosts for greater completion, but I always appreciate it when it feels more naturally weaved into the setting rather than the MMO quest feeling of I only asked for 10 bear asses, but you gave me 20. So here's this rare sword. It's a nice bonus when, honestly, many of these objectives feel reminiscent of that type of progression, which is a bit of modern open world design I was hoping wouldn't be as present in A New Beginning. Finally, we have the general quirkiness of the Talon you'll meet this time around. Quirkiness is a fine line to walk with your characters. Too quirky and they become overbearing in a hurry. Corn cob man. There's a lot of sick people in this town. But I think Appeal found a happy medium. There are plenty of wacky characters to meet in A New Beginning, but few of them feel like cartoonish caricatures. In fact, they often carry parts of the personality of their respective villages, if that makes sense to anyone besides me. What I mean is that the way these NPCs behave provide a sense akin to, of course someone from here would act that way. Of course Mirko struggles to get his dad to understand that he doesn't want to inherit the brewery. Lampe is the lifeblood of his hometown. Of course Hotso is a condescending prick. He's benefited from his village's topsy-turvy caste system his whole life. Of course Mike became obsessed with old cartoons and video games. What the fuck else is there to do in Wyoming besides get drunk and be let down by the Wyoming Cowboys and now the Buffalo Bills every year? Forget that last example. Their quirks and character flaws feel natural and fitting to their situations which is a welcome break from the trend of making every character a snarky cynic. Take it from a snarky cynic. It stops being endearing when you can't just turn off the TV to shut us up. At the end of the day, I had quite a bit of fun with Outcast: A New Beginning. If this is truly a new beginning for the series, I do see a future for Outcast. But the real question is, do I think it's worth $60? <sighs> no. No, I don't. And it hurts me to say that. In many ways, I would compare A New Beginning to something like Elix, which I recently learned was actually inspired by the original Outcast. 
An ambitious title marred by technical issues and either an insufficient budget or lack of enough development time to achieve what was dreamed during pre-production. The gameplay generally feels too tight to easily label it as jank, but A New Beginning does get danger close to such a title. Now some of my favorite games are jank. Jank is wildly overhated in my opinion. But games in this mid-tier range, jank or no, are even more rarely worth the $60 price tag than the big budget AAA releases. And publishers can kiss my pasty white ass if they think I'm paying 70. I waited for Diablo 4 to show up on Game Pass so I can damn sure wait the rest of them out too. Bing bong, hello! <clears throat> As you can probably tell, I rarely buy games on release and very likely wouldn't have here if not for the sake of a video. Now if we were looking at $40 or maybe even a $50 asking price, I would probably say to go ahead and get a new beginning if it sounds like the kind of game you gel with. But we're talking AAA price for a AA game that suffers from a number of egregious technical issues. I can't justify that price to people no matter how much fun I may have had with the game. I do sincerely hope though that the issues I experienced have been patched out by now or are on their way to being patched. Because there is clear passion on display across a new beginning that deserves recognition. Not to mention the significant jump in quality from Second Contact to this. So please appeal. Keep this upward trend going. That's it for this game. Next time, we'll be headed back to my old Sega stomping grounds with a little title known as Beyond Oasis. Or the story of Thor for anyone outside of North America. I'll see you then.